Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday, June 28th. The welcome of baptism is for all of God's children. This baptismal gift sets us free from the power of sin and death. In today's gospel, Christ promises that the disciple who gives a cup of cold water to the little ones serves Christ himself. From worship, we are sent out on our baptismal mission to serve the little ones of this world and to be a sign of God's merciful welcome.
with you. Let us pray. Oh God, you direct our lives by your grace and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your world and serve one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The readings Amen. for today, uh, Sunday, June 28th. The first reading comes from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Through a symbolic action, Jeremiah insists that Judah and all the surrounding nations should submit to the king of Babylon. Hananiah contradicted the word of Jeremiah, who in reply insisted that Hananiah's rosy prediction should not be believed until it came true. God confirmed the word of Jeremiah and sentenced the false prophet Hananiah to death. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, may the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak to your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who, pre who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Here ends our first reading. Our psalm for today is Selections from Psalm 89. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your steadfast love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength, and by your favor our might is exalted. Truly our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Here ends our psalm. And our second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, the sixth chapter. Sin is an enslaving power which motivates us to live self-serving, disobedient lives. Sin's final payoff is death. We, however, has been set free from sin's slavery to live obediently under God's grace, whose end is the free gift of eternal life. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey your passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace, by no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, and to greater and greater inequity. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for sanctification, for holiness. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you uh, then get from the things which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you've been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification or holiness. The end 
is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends our second reading. for this morning comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 40th verse. Jesus talks to the 12, saying, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Here ends our gospel reading. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Here's a question for you. What's the relationship between faith and patriotism? It was easy to see when I was growing up the connection. They seemed to go hand in hand. I remember being a little kid. I remember one beautiful spring day where uh, we must have been in, I don't know, second or third grade. We were really young, but they taught us all these great patriotic songs. Um, you know, you're a grand old flag and, and so on and so forth. And I remember going outside and singing together and being so excited and so happy to live in our country. And I remember Fourth of July parades and seeing all the beautiful flags and all the wonderful community groups and the politicians. And, um, and I grew up um, being very active in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and certainly patriotism was an important part of those. I grew up also part of the church and I grew up loving God and loving my country and I think at a certain point uh, I figured that the two went hand in hand. Those were beautiful, pure, and very naive days. Uh, it was before Watergate, but it was in the midst of race riots, most of which my parents um, kept me uh, sort of, you know, protected from, but that was right in the late 60s, right, when I would have been seven or eight or nine. And of course, we had this question of a war in Southeast Asia. And the real challenge to the idea, my country right or wrong, but my country. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to bash our country for a country. I love our country, and I love the freedoms we all so often take for granted. But there is a biblical tradition of people of faith, faith questioning, no, in fact, challenging authority, which includes politicians, church leaders, business leaders, whoever is in charge, holding them up to higher standards. And these people who were people of challenge were the prophets who we heard from today. Now, we sometimes think of those prophets as being those who could foretell the future. But that's not really what a biblical prophet did. Biblical prophets, first and foremost, commented on the present. They spoke out about injustice, idolatry, hatred, bad government, apathetic believers. Yeah, they talked about the future too, but usually it was something like this. Shape up, people of Israel, or your future's going to be pretty bad. It's really up to you. If the people repented, if they turned in a different direction, God would look after them. But it was up to them. They had to change their ways. Such was Jeremiah, the writer of our first lesson today. He lived in tough times, at a time when the people of Israel were beaten in war, their temples torn down. Most of the people shipped off to the country of their conqueror, Babylon. Only 
a remnant, a small group, were still left in Israel. It was Jeremiah who told the people before it happened that God was going to punish them for their unfaithfulness. They would be crushed politically and spiritually so that they could be reformed, recreated. Now, Jeremiah wasn't the only prophet in town, though. There were many others who were a lot easier on the people's ears, who preached that the Babylonian conquerors would soon be defeated by God, and then the people could go back to living in peace. It was a message the people loved to hear. Jeremiah hated those prophets, not because he was jealous of their popularity, but because they lied to the people. In chapter 23, he wrote, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, It shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say no evil shall come upon you. It's true even today that we should be careful of leaders who appear to say just the things that we want to hear. Actions, of course, need to go with words. Now, this sort of false prophet, this was the kind of prophet that Hananiah was, whom Jeremiah challenged in our first lesson today. Jeremiah resented Hananiah because Hananiah preached the exact opposite of the message of Jeremiah. Hananiah preached peace that God would restore the Israelites to their kingdom, wiping out their Babylonian enemies. Now, of course, the message of peace can be a message of God, but just not at that time. Peace was preached centuries before, authentically, by Isaiah, that the people of Israel would be saved from the enemy. But this was not the word of the Lord to the people of Jeremiah's time. You see, even though remain, God remains constant, God's message to God's people changes. So the word of the Lord for two different times in history can be very different, can even seem contradictory. The truth is, we need prophets, those who can interpret God's activity in the world, those who challenge us to see, to hear, to act right now. We are confronted with issues which beg for religious response. Many of these are political as well as moral. Immigration reform, health care reform, justice, criminal justice reform. How and when we should assist other countries. What powers the president should have. How much the government should be able to look to spy on the activities of their own people. This Saturday we'll celebrate the 4th of July. There's much I love and am thankful for in this country. Veterans like my father fought to preserve our freedoms and I'm deeply appreciative of their service. But every so often patriotism gets elevated to an unhealthy position. And it's part of our biblical nature to question the powers that be. We need prophets in our midst. So the question is, what do the prophets teach us? First, that it's not only all right to criticize the powers that be, that it's our responsibility. Whether you support supported Obama or Trump or whoever, it's important to look at their words, their actions, their policies. It's fine to be critical of anyone because that's our responsibility. To, um, to live under different values than, say, any politician lives by. Second, just because we are powerful and prosperous as a nation, it doesn't mean that that will last. It's interesting to be a student of history, to look at the Roman Empire, to look at any empire, and to realize that things change. Just because we want to believe that we're a country ordained by God, doesn't mean that God is happy with everything that's going on in our country and will preserve us as a sacred union uh, just because we are God's people. That sounds silly even as we say it. We hope and pray that God continues to guide us and to strengthen us. We believe in our values and in much that is right in this country, but 
We are not the only ordained people of God. Well, third, we can also say that people of faith can disagree. In every church I've been a part of, there have been people along different partisan lines, people who have looked at different specific issues in different ways, people who have spoken um, words of integrity based on their experience, which frankly is very different than my experience. And so we can believe that people of faith can disagree and can disagree in a peaceful manner. Fourth, even as we believe that God is merciful and loving, we're not saying that everything is fine with God. God seeks justice, seeks community centeredness. Uh, God sometimes says, Things are not right. We need to act to make them right. And we've been thinking about that a lot, of course, lately. Finally, the Christian message is always a message of hope. In the future, things will get better. There is hope. But part of it is God's intervention. Part of it, a lot of it, is what we choose to do with our time and energies. We know that ultimately it's God who saves the world. But the message of the prophets is that we also play a part in the world's redemption. What kind of prophetic message are we declaring? How are we acting on it? As we pray, as we reflect on God's word and live in community, how is God challenging us? How is God active in our community, in our church, and in our lives? May God give us the strength, direction, and resolve to be prophets like Jeremiah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for the shared world. God of companionship, encourage our relationships with our siblings in Christ. Bless our conversations, shape our shared future, and give our hearts eager to join in a festal shout of praise. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities, judges, and politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, meet hate, with love, and welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, or abandoned. We pray especially for those on our hearts now. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you gather in your embrace all who have died. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.
now may the one who brought Jesus from the dead also fill you with new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.